Hello, I'm Jim Demo with Clark County Close-Up. Thank you very much for meeting with us. Pleased to do so. Well, congratulations on your recent appointment to the Superior Court. Um, when you heard about the appointment, what were some of your initial reactions? Well, I was very gratified. You know, it had been a long process. It started back in uh, August of, of 2014, and uh, the, the application process for a Superior Court judge position is, uh, involves a detailed you know, background investigation, uh, lots of material that the applicants have to provide, and then a series of interviews uh, and evaluations by various legal groups. So it was, uh, it was, it was a long process, but I was, uh, I'm honored and, uh, and gratified that it, it turned out the way it did. Now, how have you been preparing for this new position? Well, it's been, uh, initially it was, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to be doing, but then when I came on the bench, uh, I, was, I was notified that I would be doing family law. And I come from a criminal law background. I'd been a, uh, a criminal prosecutor for a little over 20 years. And so this is a new area of the law to me. So it's been a lot of study and uh, review of a, of a you know, complicated statutory scheme and a lot of uh, case law that interprets it. But it's been interesting as well. Okay. You, you mentioned your background. Why don't you give us a little bit more? What, what was your background before becoming a judge? Well, I graduated from law school in 1993. And then uh, I practiced for a short period of time in a small firm in Portland. Uh, then I went out to the Yakima County uh, Prosecuting Attorney's Office and was a Deputy Prosecuting Attorney out there for a short period of time doing mostly domestic violence cases and DUIs. Uh, and then I returned to the Clark County Prosecuting Attorney's Office in 1994. And I then spent the next 20 years there initially as a, uh, as a litigation attorney uh, prosecuting uh, a broad range of cases. And then about midway through my time there I became a supervisor and uh, then I supervised a number of the different sections of the office. In my last five years there, I was the uh, chief deputy. Oh, okay. And uh, now, let's see. So you've been serving with the prosecuting attorney's office. H has your view of the role of the courts changed since now getting into the court? Well, certainly to some degree. Uh, as a deputy prosecuting attorney, you represent the people of the state of Washington, and you're prosecuting individuals for alleged violations of the state criminal code. So you're an advocate. Uh, your goal there is to try to get, I think, all the material relevant evidence you can in front of a jury and make the best arguments you can for why a particular individual, uh, you know, you believe the individual uh, committed the crime or the evidence proves the individual committed the crime. Now uh, I'm in a family law, you know, environment. And uh, in family law, there are not uh, generally juries. It's usually cases tried to a judge. So in that regard, uh, it's a different courtroom setting. Um, there, you just have the judge who's not only making the determinations as to what law applies, but also making the factual determinations, which is what a jury does when they're in a the courtroom. So it certainly is, uh, it, I think, in some ways more demanding for a judge to be in, in that situation. But, uh, but as well, it's, it's, it's an interesting environment. It's a different area of the law, but it's an important area of law as well for the functioning of society. Okay. So a as you take the bench, what are some of your goals um, to accomplish in Superior Court? Well, I think, you know, one of my major goals when I first came in was to make sure that, that parties are afforded, you know, their due process. And the basic concepts of due process are notice and an opportunity to be heard. So you want to make sure that the parties that come before you uh, have an opportunity to be heard, uh, to get, you know, the evidence that's admissible under the rules in front of you to make whatever arguments they feel are appropriate, you know, legal arguments. And the other thing to remember is that in most situations when you're in court, you're going to have somebody who's going to come out as the victor, if you will, and, and somebody who's not going to win or be the loser. Uh, and that's, that's just the nature of an adversarial, uh, you know, system of justice. But I would say that you want everybody to come out of their court hearing with a feeling that they've been treated fairly and that the decision that has been rendered is a just decision regardless of whether it went in their favor or against. So that's my goal is to, to try to have the parties you know, come out of, of courtroom hearings feeling that they've been treated fairly whether they prevailed or whether they did not. Okay. For the majority of the general public, um, you know, most of what we know about judges comes from the television shows. Certainly. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure it's not very accurate. So um, what's the typical day like for a judge? Well, it might be better to describe what a, a week is like for okay. me. Uh, so in family law, um, my week starts on a Monday. And uh, every other Monday, I, I end up having what are called settlement conferences, which is where cases come before me that are assigned to another judge. And I work with the attorneys to see if we can reach an acceptable resolution. 
So the attorneys meet with their clients. Uh, they discuss area of dispute, areas of dispute and areas of agreement. They come back to me usually with the areas that they can't agree on. We talk about what the nature of the law or the facts are in a case. I suggest you know, protect, you know, uh, possible you know, compromises. They go back, talk with their clients, and we see if we can hammer out a resolution right then. If we can, of course, it saves everybody time and money, and so you know, that's the goal. Uh, but then um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, normally for me, are uh, set aside for trials. And in a family law context, these can be, um, they can be you know, longer trials, you know, multiple day trials with lots of, lots of witnesses and lots of evidence. But sometimes they're relatively short trials, a couple hours long, looking at one or two particular issues within the context of a dissolution or a divorce. Uh, for instance, um, how the parenting plan is going to be structured or what the division of uh, assets or debts between the parties is going to be. Okay. Uh, and um, so you mentioned during a trial some of the major goals. Uh, how do you take, what steps do you take to ensure the impartiality? Well, it's important, you know, when, when you begin in a trial, one party gets to present their case first and then the other party presents their case after that. So sometimes the, uh, the person who presents their case first, often the petitioner in, in a, uh, a domestic, a domestic um, you know, case, um, has a, a compelling case. And so you, you listen to their evidence, you listen to their witnesses, and, and it sounds like a pretty strong case. But you haven't heard the other side yet, and there's almost always another you know, side of the story. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it's a very compelling you know, story as well, and sometimes it's very well supported with evidence. So you have to try to maintain your objectivity while you're listening to you know, the, the first party's you know, version of the events and, and looking at their evidence because there's going to be additional evidence that's going to come in. They're going to challenge some of the evidence that you've already heard. And so you, you need to try to you know, maintain your objectivity until you hear all the evidence in the case. Well, I imagine you hear some heartbreaking stories. That certainly is accurate. You know, it's, um, what's unfortunate is that somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of marriages in the United States uh, end in divorce. And although it appears that that, that actual percentage is, is going down at this point uh, for a number of reasons, which is good, still that means a substantial number of cases. In fact, last year about 1,600, something over 1,600 uh, dissolution cases or divorce cases were filed in our county. So there's, there's a very high volume of cases that come through the system. And often the, uh, the cases are very emotional, um, especially for cases which involve children, because there is a parenting plan that needs to be entered in every case, which determines uh, where the children are going to be spending the uh, majority of their time with the primary residential parent, and then who's going to have visitation and what the nature of that visitation is going to be. Uh, there's also division of property, there are issues of child support, and also uh, spousal maintenance. So these are all, uh, can be very emotional issues, uh, but the focus is on the welfare and the best interests of the child. And that's what I think, you know, the legislature has told judges to focus on, and that's what we try to, to focus on is what's in the best interest of the children. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you work in a fam family law court. Um, there's a number of specialty courts, felony drug court with, within superior court. Um, how do these, what are the goals of these particular programs and have they been effective? Well, there are specialty courts. Treatment courts is another, um, another term that's used to describe them. Uh, at this point, I don't actually um, have or not, part of my normal weekly um, sort of assignment doesn't involve the specialty court, but I did spend about two years in the felony drug court when I was in the prosecutor's office. So these courts are, are focused on an alternative to the traditional model of, of prosecution. Um, in a felony drug court, these are, are felony cases, and individuals uh, plead guilty to those cases, and then they uh, opt into the drug court. And what they're required to do is uh, get a substance abuse evaluation and comply with treatment, and then they have a whole series of other obligations that are placed on them. And they come back on a very regular basis in the court uh, where the drug court team, which consists, consists of a judge, a couple defense attorneys, a prosecutor, some treatment staff, a program coordinator, all get together and, and talk over how the person's doing in the program prior to coming into court. So on a very regular basis, the participant gets feedback, whether it's going to be positive or negative. If they do well in the program, they're getting lots of positive feedback from everybody, including the prosecutor. Uh, if they're having problems, they're going to be punished, uh, and a judge will assign any number of punishments, which can include incarceration. So it's, a, it's an intensive program uh, focused on trying to address the substance abuse problems that the participant is having. Uh, the good news is that if, if the person successfully completes the program, um, 
hopefully they will have addressed their substance abuse problem which related to the crime, either, you know, they have to either be under the influence while they're committing the crime or commit the crime as a result of their addiction. Um, if they've been able to address it, uh, our hope is that they will not, you know, commit crimes in the future. And in fact, I think successful participants seem to have a lower recidivism rate than uh, individuals who do not, you know, go through the program. Uh, but also these individuals then uh, gain skills uh, that allow them to become contributing members of society again, you know, to, uh, you know, engage in gainful employment, you know, reestablish, you know, positive relationships with their neighbors and their family and, and loved ones. And so, uh, you know, those are the, I think, the overall goals of the program. And, and by and large, the program seems to be successful. Okay. Well, what challenges do you see for the courts in the coming years? I think probably that the, the greatest challenge that's facing uh, the courts in a civil context in the United States, both you know, broadly, more broadly, and in our state, is access to justice. And that's a, a term, a broad term, that's used to describe um, the inability of individuals to access the justice system to resolve you know, various types of conflicts in their lives because of their inability to pay for legal counsel. So we have a lot of need for legal services, whether it's in a, you know, a, a dissolution context, which is where I work, or other family law matters, or in, more broadly in civil matters. Um, it's hard for individuals to execute their rights uh, and exercise their rights uh, if they don't understand the law. And you know, it you know, takes three years for an individual to go through law school. So I think it's hard for most regular citizens to have a full understanding and comprehension of, of how the legal uh, system operates and uh, then to be able to exercise their rights within a particular aspect of it. So they really do need assistance uh, from a lawyer to be able to understand their rights and exercise those rights. The problem is that we have a lot of folks who are uh, in poverty and, and even individuals up through the middle class find it very hard to afford legal counsel because lawyers are often fairly expensive and we have a very limited amount of lower cost or free uh, legal you know, aid in the country. Mm -hmm. So this is a problem that's been recognized for well over 20 years um, and we just we don't seem to be able to make uh, a great deal of progress in addressing it. Uh, one thing that Washington has done is um, it's created a, a, a limited legal technician program uh, which was just started in 2012. The first graduates from that program uh, graduated uh, just this past May. And this is a, um, a, a limited practice license within the domestic relations world, within the family law world, that allows non-lawyers to give limited advice and assistance to individuals who, uh, are, who need help uh, within you know, the family law context. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a, uh, a good step that the, uh, um, that the Washington Supreme Court ha has adopted because they authorized the program. And uh, we only have the first seven, so it'll be interesting to see how the program progresses, but hopefully, We'll get these individuals out, get you know, more and more folks through the program, and it, it has a, a set period of instruction and tests and all that sort of thing. But if we get more of those folks out, you know, hopefully there'll be uh, more lower cost assistance for individuals who have problems within a family law context, and we can get them the legal assistance they need. Sounds like a great program. Is there anything else you'd like to, the viewers to know about the court systems in Clark County? Well, what I would probably suggest to anyone is that uh, I, I think most people get their information about how the justice system operates from uh, the media, and whether it's it's regular uh, print media or more you know more commonly now uh, the internet or video media, uh, you get these small bites of how things operate, and and often they're um, you know the thing that goes on day to day is is not the sort of thing that perhaps catches the attention of the media. Uh, what catches the attention of the media are things that are outside the norm. But what I would suggest to anybody who's interested in the law is to the degree you have time, you know, during a uh, regular, you know, day, if you have a day off or something like that, I would suggest coming down to the courthouse. Uh, courtrooms are open. Uh, you can come into any courtroom uh, and see what's occurring. And on any given day, there are going to be uh, dockets in the morning and the afternoon, criminal dockets and, and civil dockets later on in the week. Uh, there are, are family law dockets on Friday mornings. There are trials uh, taking place, both criminal and civil, uh, and, and family law trials almost all the time. So uh, I, I think it would help anybody to, to come into court to watch how the process operates. And I would say to anybody, my experience has been that, um, that the system is there to treat individuals fairly. There are a lot of safeguards uh, that, that judges are required to enforce, and that, that's one of the things as a judge that I do is to ensure that 
that the individual rights of, of, in, of people, and in particular criminal defendants, are respected, and that um, you've got a lot of people who are well-trained and dedicated who are trying to make the system operate the way it should. And by and large, I think it does operate the way that we all would like it to operate, you know, as is structured by the legislature. Okay, well, thank you very much for meeting with us and good luck with your um, courtroom. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much for having me on your show this morning.